This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and if you're a fan of the golden age of Hollywood, this episode of our show is most definitely for you. For over 30 years, our guest was one of Hollywood's most successful respected and sought after press agents in show business history. At the age of 19, he was hired by Howard Strickling, head of publicity at MGM Studios, and was assigned to the legendary Clark Gable. In those final years of MGM's heyday, he also handled publicity for other stars, including Debbie Reynolds, Anne Blythe, Howard Keel, and Roger Moore. Then, after a stint with the iconic syndicated newspaper columnist, Harrison Carroll at the Los Angeles Herald Express, he became a publicist at the prestigious firm of Rogers and Cowan in Hollywood. And after three years, he opened his own immensely successful entertainment public relations business, where he acquired the most prestigious list of legendary clients in show business history, including Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Judy Garland, Bob Hope, Tony Bennett, Jimmy Stewart, Robert Wagner, Peggy Lee, Jack Lemmon, George C. Scott, Lee Marvin, Steve McQueen, Johnny Carson, and believe me, I'm just scratching the surface. And when business partner Paul Wasserman joined the firm, they became the premier representatives for the greatest music acts of all time, including the Rolling Stones, U2, Carly Simon, James Taylor, Bob Dylan, George Harrison, Neil Diamond, Linda Ronstadt, Glenn Campbell, and dozens more. Over the years, he developed close friendships with many of his superstar clients, and he worked night and day managing their mercurial and fragile egos, keeping their secrets, suppressing their outrageous and scandalous behaviors, and pulling out all the stops to preserve their all-important public image. He quickly became an expert not only in communications and media relations, but crisis management. And now he's written a highly compelling, entertaining, and incredibly eye-opening book entitled Get Mahoney, a Hollywood insider's memoir in which he finally tells many of the stories that he's kept close to the vest all these years. The book provides a unique perspective on the history of Hollywood and some of its most notorious characters and events. I absolutely loved this book and could not put it down until the very last page. I'm delighted to welcome Jim Mahoney to our show. Jim, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jim, you spent 70 years of your life striking a delicate balance between knowing how to get press and how to suppress it. And you always made sure to stay out of the spotlight. So what made you decide to write the book? I bet that thinking about it for a long time and I got to thinking that there's very few people that have had the opportunities that I have and the experiences that I've had and I find them uh, might be interesting for people to read these experiences and so I put it on paper. Well interesting is an understatement sir. When you were first hired at MGM, you were personally selected by Clark Gable to work for him. What do you think he saw in that 19-year-old boy? Well, it was an interesting uh, meeting. It was a Sunday morning, and my dad was an interior decorator, and Gable happened to be a client. And he, uh, my dad asked me if I'd like to come out, come with him to uh, his meeting at a rather important client, and he just finished decorating his house. And I said, I'm going to the beach. He said, no, you're coming with me today. And I I got the message that he wanted me (laughs) to come with him. And it was all set up by, I guess, Howard Strickling, who was head of publicity, and he was Gable's closest friend. And we got to the house, and Gable and my dad went in the house to discuss business. And Strickling was, this was all set up, the meeting, and, and thanks to my dad and to Strickling, and he he uh, interrogated me like it was an interview for a job, and 
got around to asking me what I was doing. And I told him I was going to USC. And he said, what are you majoring in? And I told him, girls. And, and uh, we had a nice chat. And Gable and my old man came back. And Strickling said that he had a nice uh, interview, a nice talk with me. And I told your son that if, when he got out of school, if he'd like to come out to the studio, I'd see if I could find a place for him in my department. And with that, Gable said, if he goes to work for you, Howard, I want him to handle me. That was my start. And uh, you can't get much better than that. Were you shocked? Of course I was. I mean, Gable was king. Yeah, literally, he, that was his nickname in, in the entertainment industry at the time. I lived on, in, uh, in an area in Culver City that uh, was only minutes from what referred to as the 40 acres where they shot a lot of um, motion pictures outdoor, indoor, mostly outdoor. Now, your book makes it clear that to be a good Hollywood PR person, you have to be a good listener. You have to have great street smarts. You have to be a good writer. You have to have really great people skills. And you described yourself as a lion tamer. What would you say was the key to your success? Listening to people. Be a good listener. What about <laughs> luck and timing? Did that have anything to do with it? Luck, luck had a lot to do with it. It always has with me. I mean, I, you know, I, I appreciate your kind words, but I was never much of a writer. When I read about the incredible demands on your time from all those clients, I got the impression that you have to be a workaholic to be a successful publicist. Am I right? Absolutely. I, I never took a day off. I was working from nine to 10 more of, I definitely was a workaholic. And uh, and it started when I went to work for Harrison Carroll uh, as as a gopher, as a, his leg man, and it was a hell of an education. Let me explain to you the day my day when when I was working as a as a gopher for uh, as a leg man for Harrison Carroll. I'd get up in the morning and call around to the studios to see what was being shot and who was working, and I'd you know, cherry pick the uh, studio I wanted to go to every day. And I'd go out and get to have more often than not and, and have uh, lunch with uh, the best name on the lot, whatever studio it was. And then I'd go down to the, the paper in Los Angeles, Herald Examiner, and I'd write up the stories and give them to Harris and Carol. And then I'd go out go home, get dressed, and go out and cover the, the nightclubs in Los Angeles, Macambo and the Interlude and the Crescendo and the Coconut Grove. And, and I got to meet everybody in, in the entertainment in, in industry during that two or three year period. I was uh, to Harold Lloyd's house in Beverly Hills, which is a famous old house. And uh, it's the one where there's a Christmas tree in it. 52 weeks out of the year and Sinatra was doing a movie and he asked me to join him in his trailer and Frank says to me uh, how long are you going to stay in that hokey business and I said uh, and, and until something better comes along and he said well it just did I want you to work for me so that's with, with how I started with Sinatra and 15 years later we're still representing him that's just uh, amazing. There's an, an old saying in the public relations business that the day you win an account is the first day you start losing it. Do you agree with that, Jim? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I lost him. As you might remember, he had a uh, he was on a tour in, in, uh, in Australia and he ran into a problem with uh, the press down there. And uh, I didn't happen to be there. I should have, but uh, we agreed there was no need for me to go. He was engaged at that point in time with uh, Barbara, his future wife, and uh, he didn't want to do a hell of a lot of uh, PR work. And so I uh, took took advantage of the time and went to Scotland. I, another one of my clients, which was Teacher Scotch, by the way. <laughs> 
Well, let me ask you this, Jim. When John F. Kennedy was running for president, you spent an evening with him and he asked you to come and work for him. You turned him down, but have you ever regretted that decision? No, never. I had a pretty good little PR firm going at the time, and I was representing Peter Lawford, his brother-in-law. I had a pretty good client list at the time, and uh, I talked to my wife, Pat, about it, and we decided that it would be better uh, um, to continue uh, building my PR business instead of going to Washington, D.C. I don't know what would have ever happened, but it was an interesting offer. Oh, that's for sure. You mentioned Sinatra. You said in your book that being Sinatra's press agent was a full-time job, like getting a master's degree in public relations and crisis management. What made him such a difficult client? I, I don't think that he was so much as uh, difficult, but but time-consuming. I mean, it was Frank Sinatra. He's the number one entertainer in the world. Well, one thing I learned about Sinatra from your book, Jim, was his incredible generosity. He literally raised millions of dollars for children's charities and hospitals all around the world. He was extremely generous, wasn't he? It was, it was mind-boggling sometimes as an example. When he'd go to a restaurant, he, number one, he never carried anything less than a $100 bill, and he, his pocket was full of them. And uh, he, he, he not only tipped the waiter, he tipped the uh, maitre d', he tipped the owner if he happened to be there. And he left uh, several hundred dollar bills underneath the table for the people that come in in the middle of the night to clean the restaurant. Unbelievable. Is yeah. it true that Sinatra paid for Judy Garland's funeral? That's right. Yeah. She was another client. She's the only client that ever hit me. Oh, tell me about that. Incredible talent. I was at MGM when she was under contract at MGM, and uh, they had a doctor at MGM. If uh, if a, an actor or an actress uh, came to work and had a headache or any, any kind of pain, the doctor was there to give them a shot and unfortunately started giving her shots when she was about 13. And uh, she got hooked, and it was that what with what happened for the rest of her life. Why did Judy hit you? She was doing a, the uh, CBS television weekly hour, and a fellow uh, uh, was working for me at the time. His name was Guy McElwain, and he later ran Columbia Pictures. Guy did. But on the, this particular day, I got a call from McElwain. He was at the CVS studios uh, and uh, asked, told me that uh, Judy wanted to have a press conference after uh, the Tonight Show, the show that she was preparing for was done. And uh, she wanted to tell the world what a, a jerk her husband was. So I'm, I'm cleaning up the language. And I told McElwain to tell her that we're not having a press conference. I wouldn't allow her to, to demean herself in, in such a fashion to, for, to the world. And McElwain said, there's nothing that I can do. I, I told her that we're, we won't, wouldn't do it. And I said, well, uh, you stay where you are and I'll be over there in five minutes, 10 minutes. So I went to the studio and went to her dressing room and knocked on the door and it was totally empty the entire people stayed away they didn't want any part of a, any kind of a confrontation and i was facing up to it and 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 i knocked on the door and nothing and i knocked on the door and nothing i knocked on the door a little harder and her voice i could hear her say who is it and i said it's jim mahoney she said what do you want and I said, I want to talk to you. And she said, I've got nothing to talk to you about. And I said, we're not having a press con press conference tonight. And she said, the hell we're not. And opened the door and I came in and she says, you get on the phone and get uh, set that press conference up right now. And I said, we're not having a press conference. And she came 
almost flying across the, the dressing room and, and pushed me and knocked me on my ass uh, on the couch. And uh, I got up and she came after me again and I s grabbed her and swung her around and she started flailing at me, hitting me and, and uh, pushed me down on the, on the, on the couch. And uh, she said, you're fired. And I, you know, I got my, my Irish up and, and I said, Judy, you can't fire me. You don't pay me for Christ's sake. Uh, we're not having a press conference. And she said, you're fired. And I said, you can't fire me. And I said, to hell with it. I'm out of here. And that was uh, <laughs> my confrontation with the only client that ever hit me. <laughs> wow. That is so sad, isn't it? That she was so out of control. Yeah. Terrible. Now, you were very much involved in handling the crisis when Frank Sinatra's son, Frank Jr., was kidnapped. You said that Frank got two simultaneous phone calls, one from J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, and the other one from mob boss Sam Giancana. Frank took the call from Sam Giancana first. What did you make of that, Jim? I thought it was rather amusing, and so did Frank afterwards. But J. Edgar Hoover, he, he, he had his entire staff on the job. I mean, he did a hell of a job. You know, we still didn't know where the kid was. He was still on the mountain in Reno, and uh, and every FBI man in, on the West Coast was on the case. So, but uh, they did a pretty good job. You they, said that Frank Sinatra and Bob Hope didn't like each other. Did you ever find out why? Well, there was one occasion. Hope was doing his specials, so, you know, uh, Chrysler sh sp sponsored specials, and, you know, once a month. And his agent went to Hope and said, why don't, instead of having two or three guests this week, why don't we just get Frank Sinatra and you two do the whole show? And Hope thought that was a good idea. And uh, he, uh, whatever the price was, 50000 a week for talent, uh, on the show, it, it, the whole package, 50000 would go to Sinatra. And everybody thought that was a great idea, and Sinatra agreed. And about a, a couple of days later, uh, Hope got a call from the sponsor, Chrysler, that they uh, didn't want any part of Frank Sinatra. He was not the image that uh, they wanted to, to push, and we had to get somebody else. Well, word got back to Sinatra that Chrysler didn't want him uh, as a spokesman for the weekend. So Sinatra said, so what, what are we going to do about it? He said, uh, I made a deal with him for 50000 didn't I? And, and uh, the, the agent said, yeah. And he said, we'll collect the 50000 and give it to charity. Wow. And that was the end of that friendship. I'm sure, Jim, that you got to know Sinatra probably better than any other person in his inner circle. What do you think was the biggest public misconception about him? The crime thing. Really? That, that he had an association, a relationship with the mob. He didn't need the mob. I mean, he was the number one entertainer in the world. And it, to this day, is you know, it's hard to top. Frank Sinatra, even even Elvis Presley. But he was not really involved with the mob. Not at all. I mean, why would he need the mob, for God's sake? I mean, they helped him during the, you know, the the, the dark days, as he would refer to this period in time before from here to eternity. He went through a, a bad period where he couldn't get a couldn't get a recording contract, couldn't couldn't get a job in the movies. And it was uh, pretty bad. And fortunately, when he, you know, everything turned when he did From Here to Eternity. We were going to do the movie. Some, some came running and, and Frank and Dean and I were on our way to Chicago to stop over in Chicago for uh, uh, some, a friend's birthday party. And I didn't know who the hell they were talking about. We, we were on our way to 
Madison, Indiana, I think it was where we were located shooting the uh, movie. And we uh, got, got to uh, make a long story short, the uh, birthday boy was Sam Giancana. Oh. And it, it, it isn't, it isn't as, as though Sinatra, you know, all the time I was with him for 15 years. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't recall meeting of any kind, socially or otherwise, with uh, mobsters. He, he merely was uh, paying tribute to Giancana because Giancana and his pals kept him going during the dark ages, as he referred to him he, before, before. So it wasn't unusual for you know, for Frank to to see these people, they'd, they'd come to Vegas. What could he do about that? He, you know, and uh, he certainly couldn't ignore them. That wouldn't be a good idea. Well, I'm glad you cleared it up in your book, Jim. Yeah. Now you represented Eddie Fisher and you wrote that his marriage to Debbie Reynolds was doomed right from the start. Did they not love each other? I... Uh, I don't really think so. They were two kids, and it, maybe it was, maybe they rushed into it. That's the, it, probably the kindest uh, r uh, way I could explain it. They rushed into it. Yeah. Well, you tried very hard to persuade Eddie Fisher not to pursue a romance with Elizabeth Taylor after her husband, Mike Todd, died. It must have been really frustrating for you to watch his career and his public image self-destruct what kind of damage control did you try to do when all the negative press came out all, all i could do was try to you know uh, influence him and con convince him that what he was doing was gonna uh, destroy his career and uh, he didn't listen uh, obviously how did you deal with that frustration when your clients just don't listen to you Sometimes I quit. I don't blame you. You know, I, I quit Peggy Lee. I quit Judy Garland after she hit me. <laughs> well, there's a few more in the book. Not many, though. You really did not have to quit because they loved you so much. Steve McQueen was another one that, that uh, I quit. Maybe yeah, I'm going to ask you about him. But first, I want to ask you about Elvis Presley's manager, Colonel Tom Parker. You described him as charismatic, part snake oil salesman and part politician, and one of the greatest promoters of all time. Now, Jim, he wanted you to pay him $25,000 to be Elvis's publicist, and you refused. Did you ever regret that decision? Not at all. I, mean, I, never, I never had a problem getting clients. That's which was rather unusual. I mean, you, you've got a list of them there, and it was enough to keep a company alive for a long time. I could probably still be doing it if, uh, but it's, it's I, I don't know whether I'd have the patience. Now, tell me about Steve McQueen. You said he was one of the most difficult clients you ever had. He even turned down Butch Cassidy because he would not take second billing to Paul Newman. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, definitely. So that was pretty lucky for Robert Redford. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> well, what made Steve McQueen so hard to work with? Was it his ego? Yes, absolutely. You know, he wouldn't take second billing. I mean, for, for that part, and it's crazy, but he, uh, he was, uh, I'll give you an a, a example. I'd take him on tour to open a movie or, and we, he, he wouldn't get in the car, uh, the limousine, um, unless it was white and it was this year's model. That's simple little things like that. And, uh, the, uh, there, there are other things that, uh, so did you quit? Yeah. I don't blame you. Now, you know, Jim, over the years, you've put out some pretty big fires for major stars like Burt Lancaster, Lee Marvin, Alan Ladd, Sonny and Cher, and of course, Sinatra. Can you recall what was the worst crisis you ever had to handle? Well, let me think about that a second. Uh, 
Would it be maybe the kidnapping of Sinatra's son? Well, it, it was not difficult. I mean, I, I never had any, uh, I mean, it sounds sort of egotistical, but I never had a problem that I didn't handle, you know? I don't well, know. Jim, tell me about your work with the big syndicated columnists like Hedda Hopper, Luella Parsons, Walter Winchell. What were they like to deal with? It, it was they were, it was fun, you know. It, it when during that period in time when I was working at for Howard Strickling at MGM, I was learning the business, and uh, part of the business was re, uh, building relationships with th th these columnists that you know uh, had the 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 pen and typewriter and uh, they needed information every day for their columns and uh, it was a good idea to have a good relationship with Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons and, and Walter Winchell and Earl Wilson and uh, Herb Kane, San Francisco and uh, Shirley Eater in Chicago, Irv Kupsinet in Detroit and and you build a relationship with those people which is vital to, to you know well i was really fascinated by what you said about being a big star you said that the vast majority of legendary stars that you knew were extremely insecure very unhappy people you mentioned lee marvin and george c scott as being two of the most unhappy celebrities you ever knew why do you think these famous people were so unhappy well <clears throat> George C. Scott, he uh, he thought he thought acting was child's play, and uh, he, he he was never impressed with it. And uh, he, he was doing things that kids do when they're ten years old. And he, what about what about Lee Marvin? You said he was so unhappy. Why do you think that was? Lee was a a real character. He was a legitimate war hero and he never got over the the uh, that experience and uh, I don't know whether I put it in, in the book but I got a call one night from an officer from Camp Pendleton in uh, the Marine Corps headquarters in in uh, Newport Beach in that area and he said, uh, are you Jim Mahoney? I said, yes. He said, do you represent Lee Marvin? And I said, yes. And I said, who is this? He said, I'm the commander of Camp Pendleton and your client, Mr. Marvin, is here and he wants to re-enlist. Oh, my God. <laughs> what did you do? I, fortunately, my son is a lawyer, Jim Jr., and we went to Camp Pendleton and brought Lee Marvin home. He had a few drinks and uh, decided he wanted to re-up. And uh, he got he got uh, the shit shot out of him. And uh, I think it was, uh, he, he made like 11 landings in the South Pacific. I think it was Kwajalein where he was shot, shot up pretty bad. Spent a lot of time in a hospital ship in the Pacific. And to, to the day he died, it was, he uh, felt that he let his troops down his, and he, he should have gone back into battle. That's right. one of the things that bugged him. And it, and it, um, it, it, it was with him till he died. Well, you said, I thought this was really fascinating, Jim. You said there were only three stars that you knew who you felt were truly happy. Jimmy Stewart, Jimmy Cagney, and Fred Astaire. And you've got Fred Astaire's Emmy Award on the shelf behind you. How did you get that? Yes, the widow gave it to me. She said that uh, she thought uh, that he would prefer that I had it, which was a nice tribute. You were very good friends with Gary Cooper, right? Yeah, that's he was uh, one of my early clients, and we became very good friends. It was, you know, it was uh, he. he <laughs> it was during that period in time when I was writing the gossip column, and 
one evening I was uh, meeting my wife for dinner at, uh, I think the re restaurant was La Dolce Vita, but uh, I was at the bar and I heard a couple having a good time in the, in the back room. All of a sudden out comes Gary Cooper and after Gary Cooper came Anita Eckberg. And I thought to myself, wow, what a nice piece of gossip this is. But I, you know, and I was, I never felt as though I, my career was going to end up by me writing a gossip column. And I didn't do anything with the fact that uh, he was seeing Anita Eckberg, a happily married man, supposedly. That's the kind of stuff that gossip columnists love, as you can imagine. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I was back at the same restaurant and back in the back room uh, it was Anita Eckberg and, and Gary Cooper. Again? Uh, yeah. And so the next day I was on my run, running around uh, trying to find somebody to interview for my column, for the column. And, and I went to Paramount. And I uh, and Gary Cooper was making a movie, uh, and I told the press agent who had me in tow, I'd like to speak to Mr. Cooper alone. Well, press agents don't like that, and I said, believe me, it's it, it's for his good. And so I he introduced, takes me to Cooper's dressing room, and. He's a little disturbed that uh, I want to talk to him alone. And uh, I said, Mr. Cooper, I said, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. And I I just wanted to, uh, he says, what, are you, what, what is the talk? What, what? I said, Anita Eckberg. And he says, oh, my God, Jesus, no, no, don't tell me. I said, I'm not going to write anything about it, but I... But, you know, I I go to the same restaurant you do and you're going to it's going to be exposed and somebody's going to write about it and you're going to be in deep shit at home. And he said, thank you. You're not going to write it. No, I'm not going to write anything about it. So that's how I got started with Gary Cooper. We became very good friends and he became a good source for stories later on and later became a client. So you were really smart to save him and do something honorable for him and it paid off did you have to do that a lot in the business yes uh, a, a lot a lot of things well you know one of the people you wrote about that i was very surprised was howard cosell you were good friends with him he had this reputation for being a bit of a bombastic blowhard but what was he like in real life he was like that <laughs> was he yeah. <laughs> well, why did you like him so much? I don't know. We got along well, and uh, he used to spend time with us at my house in uh, in Beverly Hills. He when he'd come to town, he was he was. Uh, let me tell you something. Howard Cosell is a genius. He was. Yes, as simple as that. To follow him around, I mean, uh, you, you know, he he do the recaps and and. He would uh, talk about players and and uh, and uh, and their outstanding activities and and uh, performances, and he never had as much as a that note paper. I mean, this is all up here, and and uh, he was incredible. He knew where the this the, you know Harry Overgate, there's Sam Sausage, and he knew where they went to school. He he. Uh, he he knew where they went to high school. I mean, it was, he had a mind on him that was unbelievable. And, you know, he, he was easy to, easy to hate, but to me, he was a good, fun to love. <laughs> well, you know, Howard Cosell always gave me the feeling that he wanted to be a respected journalist or maybe a news anchor, not just a commentator. Is that right? He was told by Rune Arledge, who was, I did. Uh, he was told by Rune Arledge that he would was uh, when he was through with the sports, uh, he he'd hire him to do news. He'd be doing network news, and uh, that never happened. And 
it was a big disappointment of his. So one of the most fascinating chapters in your book is the one about Johnny Carson. You said he was somber, gloomy, very private, lonely, a lost soul. Those were your words. Did you ever figure out, Jim, why was he that way? Well, he was an interesting character. He, he was, when, when the lights went on, he was Johnny Carson. And uh, when the lights went off, he could be a miserable uh, person to be around. That's just so sad that this guy spent all those years entertaining us in our homes, yeah. but he wasn't happy himself. No. Well, when you were writing the book, Jim, were there some stories that you deliberately chose to leave out because you don't want to tarnish anybody's reputation? And no, the, no, there's nothing I left out. Well, I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Jim Mahoney and his book by going to his official website, getmahoney.com. Well, Jim, I only have one more question for you, and it's this. What do you think of the public relations world today with the internet and the social media, the lack of the big, big stars like there used to be? What do you think of all that? It's not as much fun as it used to be. I can tell you that for sure. And the... Uh... The studio system's gone. I mean, I have had a have a picture here. I don't know whether you can see it, but can you yes, see? Yep. Can you? Oh see yes, it? I can see that. If you hold it up a bit higher, yes. That's the publicity department at MGM Studios in 1950. Well, there's a lot of people there. At least 30. That's right. And in in those days, 20th Century Fox, Paramount, United, every every studio had a department, maybe not as big as this, but they all had a department full of PR people that are working 24 hours a day. That, so that's in my backyard in in Beverly Hills. Wow. And it was a Christmas party I had. I was I was I was gone from the publicity department at that time, and I was had my own PR business. But it's, I think that's fascinating because all the studios had that a department at least that big, pumping out charming things about their stars. Do you miss the old days when you were handling the biggest stars in the world? No, not at all. I um, I had a had a good time, and I I I don't miss it. I'm glad I, that, that I got an opportunity to put it on paper, though. Well, it's one of the best books I've ever read. It's just filled with so much inside information about the people that we grew up idolizing. It's just been an absolute pleasure meeting you, Jim, and talking about your amazing life and your career. Thank you for writing the book. And thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to say a special thank you to R.J. Wagner, Robert Wagner. He's a very dear mutual friend of ours. And he was the one that suggested that you come on our show. And I, I think we should both say hi to R.J. Hi, R.J. <laughs> hi, R.J. We love you. I get a kick out of when I was handling R.J., he was, uh, he and Natalie had gone to dinner in Beverly Hills. He was, they were leaving the restaurant and uh, there were two or three like borderline hoodlums uh, outside the restaurant and they were, saw Natalie Wood and they started saying some rather rude things and um, about what they wanted to do with uh, Natalie. And in front of RJ? was the mistake they made because he knocked them on their ass. I don't know how many of them he knocked on their ass, but on, the cops were called and fortunately they were there and broke it all up. And uh, I got a call from uh, Wagner and as luck would have it, the chief of police in Beverly Hills at that point in time happened to be a, a friend of mine and we'd gone to grammar school together 
and his name was Dick Tracy, and he was the chief of police in Beverly Hills. That was his real name? Tracy, yeah, isn't that something? And in in those days, I had a pretty good relationship with the the with the law law and order, and it was it behooved me to make friends with the, the chief of police wherever, if because of some of my clients would like Lee Marvin or George C. Scott would get into r- risky situations, and and I had a, a fortunately for me a back door to the source, so to speak. So did RJ get arrested for the assault? No. Boy, you did your job well, Jim. I got I got him out of there and, and, and home. And another the other time, he, he, there was a, a situation with uh, Lee Marvin and Lee Marvin in, in Malibu. And um, during that period when he was getting a separation or whatever from Michelle Trioli, was another time where, uh, fortunately for me, I had a pretty good relationship with the, the sheriff. It just sounds like you never got starstruck. You know, you just did your job. You never really got starstruck by these people. How, how could I get starstruck after Gable? Uh, <laughs> Steve McQueen's of the world are a joke. I mean, Gable, is, you know, I mean, he was the king. And... Uh, And he taught me a lot. He sure did. Well, you've taught us a lot with your book. I want you to know I loved it. And I'm so proud that you came on our show. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. Our guest has been legendary Hollywood press agent Jim Mahoney, whose book, Get Mahoney, a Hollywood insider's memoir, is now available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver my director of programming, Deborah Batsifin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR director, Lori Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV One Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.